Um, today's uh, material, stuff that I have to go over, uh, this uh, is not really interesting stuff necessarily from an exciting um, clinical standpoint, but we'll try and highlight some of the uh, material from a clinical standpoint to make it relevant. Uh, for the residents, resident Chris, uh, yeah. So for the residents, what I would try and do in it, uh, is read through this once and have some sort of note system where you can summarize uh, what you think is important out of it. So you don't have to go back and read it again. And then as you go through your notes to review for OCAPs, if you read something and you're like, well, I'm not sure what that means, go back and read that specific section and maybe just you know, boost up or uh, you know, shore up your notes to make it a little easier. Uh, essentially, this would be what this PowerPoint lecture would be for me if I were preparing for OCAPs. This is just sort of a, a note summarization of all of this information. It is chock full of information. Um, this section, I think it covers about 60 or 70 pages in this BCSC book. So it'd be all, it's going to be impossible to go through all of it here today in one hour. Uh, so again, I'm going to try and highlight uh, some, of, some of the findings there, some of the uh, information I think is a little more useful, at least from a clinical standpoint. So anatomy of lens, I think we all know, there's no blood supply, it depends on aqueous for nutrient delivery and waste removal. Um, some interesting facts in terms of with aging that we see with uh, the lens, of course we know that it refracts, refracts light due to the difference in the index of refraction between aqueous and vitreous and the lens material itself. With aging, we see an increase in lens curvature, which should, in theory, increase the lens power. But there are very changes in the index of refraction of the material that can cause either a myopic or hyperopic shift. Of course, classically, we know with increasing nuclear sclerotic cataract, we tend to see a myopic shift and it increases that index of refraction. Uh, size, uh, this is something useful from a surgical standpoint, knowing uh, what your typical size is of the, the human adult lens, which is about nine millimeters in circ circumference and five millimeters anterior posteriorly, so the thickness about five millimeters. That depth can be useful in terms of instruments, knowing what size your instrument is as you're inserting it into the lens material, knowing what depth uh, you can safely uh, go to there. So let's see. The capsule, um, from a clinical standpoint or surgical standpoint, we're mostly interested, of course, the posterior aspect of the capsule being very, very thin, two to four microns. We want to be gentle uh, with that posterior capsule. Uh, just know it's made out of type 4 collagen and it's an elastic membrane. The zonules, which support the lens, uh, maintain it in position. Uh, you know, the few basic things you need to know about this, they originate from the basal lamina of the non-pigmented epithelium of the pars plane and pars placata of the ciliary body. They insert in a continuous fashion in the equatorial region, both anteriorly and posteriorly, and with age, these Directly equatorial fibers tend to regress, leaving more of the anterior and posterior fibers uh, behind to support the lens. The lens epithelium is a single layer anteriorly. Uh, this is where the, the active replication is occurring in the anterior equatorial region. It's called the germinative zone. Uh, the newly formed cells will migrate equatorially and posteriorly to form new lens fibers, and their dramatic uh, cellular structure changes as that process occurs. Uh, you'll see them uh, increase membrane protein, of course, lose their organelles uh, as they do that. They depend almost completely on glycolysis for energy production, take you back to your biochemistry days undergrad. Uh, let's see, the anatomy of the nucleus cortex. Uh, no cells are ever lost from the lens. The oldest cells are going to be found in the, in the nucleus, the center part of the lens, and the newest cells are the most outer, outermost aspect of the cortex. Uh, Let's see, the lens, let's see. If we look at the histology or morphology of the lens, there's really no distinction between cortex and nucleus. You can slice up the lens, prep it, put it under a microscope, you're not going to be able to tell a difference uh, in terms of where that lens cell came from. Uh, so surgical texts that describe the endonucleus, the epinucleus, the cortex, that's a description of how that material behaves, the older lens cells versus the newer lens cells, and not necessarily a histologic or morphologic difference between those uh, lens cells. Uh, this is all pretty boring. I won't bore you with that. Membrane structure proteins, it's got skeletal proteins. Yeah, I don't really see a lot of them. If they test you on this material, they're just mean. 
on the OCAPs. Uh, so this, uh, in terms of aging of the lens, there is an increase of the water insoluble proteins with age. Uh, as these proteins aggregate, we'll start to see opacification, reduced clarity. So it scatters lights, uh, the glare symptoms uh, the patient might complain about. Uh, even though they don't have much of a cataract, and it's probably from those, those types of changes. Uh, so let's see, a certain amount of that process, of course, normal. Excess of this will begin to result in cataract formation. Uh, there's a good correlation with the amount of insoluble protein in a brunescent cataract, so there's a relative lens density. Uh, and some of the changes that appear to result in this, there's a loss of redu the reduced form of glutathione, which is designed to help prevent oxidative change or stress. Uh, so we'll start to see disulfide bonds between protein material uh, in the lens cells and other forms of cross-linking increase and we get yellow and brown pigment deposition uh, cha changes. Um, of course, that's what a cataract looks like. All of us, have, most of us have seen that in clinic. Uh, let's talk about carbohydrate metabolism. This can be interesting in a few clinical scenarios. Uh, so we know that glucose can enter via both passive or simple diffusion and active facilitated diffusion mechanisms. Most of the glucose is phosphorylated by G6P2, uh, excuse me, G6P by the enzyme hexokinase. This is the rate limiting step in glycolysis, about 70 to 100 times slower than any other um, enzymes in that system. Uh, glucose 6 phosphate will then pass through either two, either two pathways anaerobic glycolysis, um, with the rate limiting step being phosphofructokinase, uh, which is regulated by feedback control. You only get two. ATP produced through this system for one glucose molecule relative to 38 in the Krebs cycle, the oxidative metabolism cycle. So it's uh, not real efficient use of glucose. Uh, let's see, this, uh, let's see, due to low oxygen tension, let's see, 3% of glucose passes through oxidative processing. It's interesting that only 3% of glucose passes through oxidative processing, but it still creates about 25% of your lens ATP uh, because of that difference in efficiency. Uh, when we look at experimental models, the lens can remain transparent without oxygen. It doesn't require oxygen, thus demonstrating the, the dependence on glycolysis, its ability to depend on glycolysis. We put it uh, in a medium without glucose, uh, it will not remain transparent. So the glucose is absolutely required for that transparency. The other pathway that G6P will go through is the hexose monophosphate shunt. About 5% of it goes through that, produces NADPH for fatty acid nucleotide biosynthesis and some of the uh, uh, oxidative stress uh, pathways to help support those. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the diabetic cataract. Anybody, without looking at this, can anybody tell me how a diabetic cataract develops? Does anybody know? Okay, we're going to learn today then. Uh, so we've talked about non-phosphorylated glucose will enter the sorbitol pathway. In most cases, that's a very small amount that goes through that. Uh, aldose reductase is the key enzyme. Uh, this Michael LS constant, 700 times that of hexokinase. Affinity is inversely related to that. So you can see it's a very high constant. So obviously the affinity is fairly low for glucose. So it doesn't grab onto glucose very well. Uh, and thus, uh, no with normal levels of glucose uh, around surrounding the cell, uh, very little of that glucose goes through this pathway. Um, with higher levels of glucose, however, there's feedback inhibition of the glycolysis pathway, and thus a greater amount of this glucose can be fed through the sorbitol pathway. Uh, sorbitol is then converted to fructose by this enzyme here, which also has a low affinity uh, for fructose. So again, the, the sorbitol pathway has multiple sort of checks, if you will, uh, in the normal system where very little of uh, glucose is sent through that pathway. Um, but if we have this feedback inhibition, a lot more glucose sitting around, eventually it starts to be processed through this. So thus it takes a fairly high amount of sorbitol, it will build up in the setting of high glucose. This, this is how that happens. Sorbitol is poorly permeable, and of course that uh, is important to understand in this mechanism of diabetic cataract, is that if you have a lens bathed in a high glucose setting, uh, we get lots of sorbitol retention or production. Uh, with high glucose levels, we see a significant NADPH to NADH ratio, which also drives additional sorbitol activity. Um, and this accumulated uh, utilized NADP will also, uh, due to the sorbitol pathway, will drive the HMP shunt activity as well. But sorbitol and fructose will accumulate in the lens in, in the setting of high glucose, uh, and this will 
generate osmotic pressures, which draw water into the lens, which will overwhelm energy-dependent pumps. It's trying to pump that fluid back out. Eventually, the lens fibers will swell, it'll disrupt the cytoskeletal structure, and the lens becomes opacified. So that's how a diabetic cataract develops in the setting of high glucose it's a sorbitol pathway, retention of sorbitol with osmotic stress, uh, causing the lens to swell. Do you have a question? Well, ultimately, um, is it the same endpoint as a age-related cataract, or on like path histopathology, would they look different? Uh, so this would look a lot like a, a cortical cataract in terms of cortical cataract is due to swelling of the lens structure. To be honest, I don't know if you looked at it histopathologically whether it would look any different. Uh, you know, a swollen opacified lens versus a oxidatively stressed lens. I guess if you looked at it with certain stains, and I'm not a pathologist, so I'm just sort of, con this is conjecture on my part, uh, it might look a little bit different. but. Uh, most of the time I've read, where I've read through this material, when it talks about looking at things morphologically or histopathologically, it's really hard to distinguish between these things, between a clear lens and a cataractus lens as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit uh, about oxidative damage protective mechanisms. Uh, so, of course, we're all familiar with what free radicals are. Uh, it can be, of course, generated at low levels by normal metabolism, radiant energy. We have relatively low oxygen tension around the, uh, and in the lens, and so uh, the oxidative stress is likely not necessarily interacting with oxygen first, but acting directly on lens proteins and lipids. We have protective mechanisms to try and prevent this, uh, glutathione peroxidase, catalase, superoxide dismutase, vitamin E, and vitamin C ascorbic acid. Uh, we know that increased levels of oxygen can result in cataract formation, and this cl is clinically relevant. Uh, this is seen in the setting of hyperbaric therapy, uh, and in the setting of vitrectomy. We know when we vitrectomize the eye, we remove the vitreous. The vitreous has a fair amount of vitamin C, among other uh, oxygen uh, utilizing or protective mechanisms for oxidative damage from oxygen. Uh, it also consumes oxygen. Uh, so as we remove that, oxygen tension increases in the posterior segments, and that will uh, facilitate oxidative stress, damage, and lens opacification or cataract formation. So that's why we often see that after vitrectomy surgery, especially in patients who already have started some of this process uh, over the age of 50. All right, so let's see. A couple of brief things off of this. Relative to aqueous and vitreous, know that the lens has a higher concentration of potassium and amino acids. I do remember seeing that on OCAPs. Uh, and it has a lower concentration internally of sodium chloride and water. So there are these both passive gradients and active transport mechanisms that uh, take advantage of this. Um, uh, it's referred to as the pump leak theory uh, with this sodium potassium ATPase helping to maintain that. Uh, we won't belabor any of those. Accommodation and presbyopia, so this is somewhat clinically relevant. Uh, so the Hemholtz theory, which is sort of the theory that most uh, most of us sort of ascribe to uh, in terms of how accommodation occurs, the ciliary body contracts, increases diameter of the ciliary body ring, which uh, results in changes in zonular tension. So it's reduced zonular tension that allows the lens to increase in spherical curve and shape, particularly in the center anterior aspect of the lens. Uh, and this will allow us to increase the power of the lens, allow you to focus on something up close. Uh, the change in the central anterior capsule is, uh, you know, where it's fo more focal in that area is thought due to the relatively thinner anterior capsule centrally versus the equatorial. And remember, we went through the thickness. I didn't highlight it too much, but it's a little thinner in the center and anteriorly relative to the anterior uh, equatorial regions. Um, of course, accommodative response is going to be stimulated by uh, the distance of the object you're looking at or blur, chromatic aberration is thought to maybe help stimulate that. Of course, parasympathetic innervation mediates it. Uh, loss of accommodation with age, something just to be aware of, is something you might see on the OCAPs. An adolescent has quite a bit of uh, accommodated amplitude, 12 to 16 diopters. At the age of 40, it drops down to 48 diopters. After age 50, it decreases to less than two diopters, obviously. Most patients become symptomatic from a presbyopia standpoint, assuming they're emetropic around the age of 45. The cause of this process is thought to be due to a hardening of the lens, which increases over a thousand fold over a lifetime. 
other con possible contributing factors to presbyopia, uh, lens dimension changes. Of course, we talked about the lens continuing to grow throughout life, so it might result in reduced um, sort of reduced leverage, if you will, this uh, ciliary body zonular system as it enlarges, loss of capsule elasticity with age, geometry of the zonular attachments, and sort of the loss that we talked about equatorially, maybe that plays a little bit of a role as well with age. Uh, embryology, this is just rote memorization. Try to know a few things about it, but don't worry about too many of the details. So I'm gonna skip over it, because it's really boring to me. Let's talk about, uh, let's see, congenital anomalies. Uh, congenital aphakia is fairly rare. I've never seen it. Lenticonus and lenticlobus. So lenticonus, nice to know uh, some of the associations with systemic diseases. So anterior lenticonus. Uh, lenticonus is just a focal cone-shaped deformation of the an anterior posterior capsule. Uh, posterior is more common. It's usually unilateral and sort of a sporadic finding. Anterior is often bilateral associated with outboard syndrome. So you see anterior lenticonus, uh, certainly ask the question if they've been diagnosed, and oftentimes they have. Uh, but if they haven't, uh, you know, suggest the primary doctor considering an evaluation for outboard syndrome. Uh, let's see, retinoscopy in these cases will show this sort of central myopic distorted reflex, uh, or it might, uh, red reflex, excuse me, will show sort of an oil droplet look centrally. And the bulging may progress, uh, you get sort of this myopic shift. Uh, sometimes you get a focal opacity or a cataract in that area where the, the capsule is deformed. So the uh, lens coloboma, we have two types. Uh, primary coloboma, which is just a wedge-shaped defect of the lens itself. It's isolated in a secondary, which has sort of the same shape as this primary, but it's associated with a ciliary body zonular defect, developmental anomaly, um, a uveal coloboma essentially uh, is caused there. Sometimes you can get a focal cortical opacity, you get some thickening of the capsule in that area. Very common for the zonules either to be weak or absent in the area of the coloboma, something to be aware of from a surgical planning standpoint. Uh, let's see, Mettendorf dot, epicapsular star, exciting there. Peter's anomaly. You'll learn about that in cornea. Uh, Microspherophakia. Most commonly seen in wheel Marchesani syndrome, uh, which is a, the sort of the antithesis of uh, Marfan syndrome. These are short patients with uh, short stubby fingers. Uh, it's inherited autosomal recessively. Uh, so just know that association, microspherophakia, wheel Marchesani syndrome. The concern with microspherophakia, we've got a small lens, it's spherical. Uh, it can uh, block the pupil, increasing the risk for acute angle closure and glaucoma. Uh, myotics will aggravate this as it will cause forward lens movement. Uh, so cycloplegic is preferred in this scenario to increase the tensile force of the zonules, bring that lens posteriorly, and reduce the uh, anterior posterior lens diameter. Uh, of course, an LPI is the treatment to try and help prevent uh, that particular issue. Uh, aniridia. Know about the association with the PAX6 gene, which comes up with Peter's anomaly as well. Uh, so this will, uh, this uh, transcription factor is very important to the development of the cornea, the lens, and the retina. Uh, so aniridia is essentially a panocular syndrome, though the aniridia is the most striking clinical feature. Uh, you know, when a general physician might be evaluating the patient, because there's partial or near complete absence of, of absence of the iris. But other findings that you'll notice on slip exam or complete exam, you see some corneal panis uh, due to limbal stem cell deficiency or failure. Uh, they can get a corneal epitheliopathy from that same problem. So corneal specialists are very familiar with uh, aniridia because of that effect. You can also see a form of glaucoma thought to be due to some developmental anomalies of the uh, trabecular meshwork. Uh, you can have foveal and optic nerve hypoplasia uh, so diminished visual function in general, which can result in nystagmus. Uh, it's nearly always bilateral, and about two-thirds of cases are familial, so it's an inherited uh, defect, though you can see sporadic cases associated with the Wagger complex. Uh, you can get cataract as well, anterior or posterior polar opacity. It can be present at birth, and uh, within the first two decades of life, about 50 to 85% of patients will go on to develop cataract. So cataract is a likely problem early on. Uh, 
they have pores annuals or pores annular integrity, so it's important to be aware of that from a surgical planning standpoint as well. All right. So a few basic things about congenital cataract, about a third of them are syndromic, a third of them are isolated but inherited, and a third of them are just will be of unknown cause. You'll do a workup and you won't, won't really find any specific cause. Uh, they occur in about one in 2,000 live births. Uh, and they're usually present at birth or within the first year of life. There are a number of different types uh, that I won't necessarily spend a lot of time on in terms of what they look like. You can kind of review through that. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the polar cataract. Uh, if it's if you've got an anterior polar cataract, they're typically small because they're a little bit further away from the nodal point of the eye. They don't require surgery necessarily because they don't impact vision as much, but they can result in an isometropia. It's important to monitor them closely for uh, differences in refractive error and make sure that that's corrected. Uh, posterior polar uh, effects or posterior subcapsular cataracts are going to be often more visually significant because they are typically larger and closer to the nodal point of the eye. Of course, with a posterior polar cataract, I think most of us, at least from res residents, are probably familiar with the concept that they're associated with capsule fragility, or in some cases thought to be a capsule defect. So it's always wise as you're going through surgical planning to be aware of that and adjusting your surgical plan to compensate for that. Essentially, we don't hydrodissect the lens, we only hydrodelineate. We try and remove the lens layer by layer uh, to get to that final area where the capsule may be very fragile at the very end of cortical removal. Uh, let's see, that's about all we've got on that. We'll skip that. All right, so ectopia lentis uh, can be congenital, developmental, or acquired. Uh, a subluxated lens is partially displaced, a luxated or dislocated is completely displaced from the pupil. This implies the loss of essentially all of the zonules. Uh, symptoms with ectopia lentis, obviously decreased vision if that lens is decentered. We can see marked astigmatism due to tilting of the lens, monocular diplopia, uh, and iridodonesis if the lens is moving a lot and we've got a lot of zonular weakness or loss. Complications include, of course, cataract. We can see displacement of the lens into the anterior chamber or into the vitreous cavity. This is, if it's acquired, it's typically due to trauma. Uh, systemic associations include Marfan syndrome, homocystinuria, and iridia, which we talked about, congenital glaucoma. Less commonly, Ehlers-Danlos, though you want to be aware of it in patients with Ehlers-Danlos. There are a variety of different Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. Some of them are going to be more likely to be associated with ocular findings and others won't be. Uh, so try, trying to find that uh, specific subtype will help. Uh, hyperlysinemia sulfide oxidase deficiency. It can be an inherited isolated anomaly, and there's an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with that. So Marfan syndrome. Uh, is a mutation of the fibrillin gene on chromosome 15, autosomal dominant inheritance, although 15% don't have a family history, so maybe a sporadic uh, uh, genetic defect. These patients are tall, uh, they have chest wall deformities, they have a dilated aortic root, mitral valve prolapse, so uh, commonly there's a lot of concern about cardiac risk in these patients. 50 to 80% will show ectopia lentis. Uh, usually it's symmetric and it's Superior temporal displacement. That's an OCAP question they like to ask. Uh, zonules will remain intact. You'll see them, but you'll notice they're stretched and elongated. So if you get a chance to see one of these cases with Dr. Crandall, who's probably the one that does the most cases, uh, myself and some of the other surgeons do them occasionally, uh, but you'll see that stretched, elongated uh, component to the zonules. They're weak, but still have some structural integrity. Uh, let's see. Uh, they often will have significant axial myopia and they have increased risk of retinal detachment. Uh, <clears throat> they often require a bifocal at a younger age due to weak or absent accommodation, maybe related to the zonular weakness. If you do a lensectomy, it, there's an increased risk of vitreous loss and retinal detachment in those cases, obviously more complex surgery. Uh, we'll skip homocystinuria, hyperlysinemia. Let's talk a little bit about uh, genetic contributions to age-related cataract. So identical and fraternal twin studies suggest that at least a portion of age-related cataract formation is heritable. Uh, so about 50% based of, on studies uh, of cortical cataract development is thought to be genetic or heritable. Uh, this mutation, which I don't 
anticipate would ever come up on OCAP, so don't worry too much about it. Uh, and then they estimate, based on different studies, about 35% of nuclear cataract risk is genetic or heritable. Uh, let's see. So this, of course, suggests there's some genetic uh, links, underlying biologic pathways that would be important to assisting us in understanding potential targets for therapy that could put us out of business as cataract surgeons. So just ignore that aspect. Nobody do any research in that. It's bad for business. I know that there are actually some people looking at drops. Uh, I think they are designed to reduce the oxidative stress to the lens in theory might help to sustain greater accommodative amplitude in, into older age and may help to reduce at least nuclear cataract formation. Uh, I think it's been through a phase two trial with some success and so they may be moving to a phase three. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if that comes out. For those of you who are a little older, maybe sooner, hopefully, hopefully sooner before you start getting reading glasses, right? All right, so let's see, ectopia lensis at pupillae, uh, this is autosomal recessive. So this has the, of course, the ectopia lensis lens dis subluxation, but also a pupil displacement, usually in the opposite directions. The pupil is typically irregular and slit-shaped, and this is usually bilateral, but you'll see asymmetric clinical appearance between the two. Pupil dilates poorly, uh, and you'll see associated ocular anomalies, myopia, retinal detachment, uh, cataract, among others. Uh, let's see. Let's talk a little bit about, about age-related lens changes, how they develop. Uh, let's see, so we've talked about aging effects, lens increasing in mass, thickness, and, and a loss of accommodative power uh, over time. We know that with new layers of cortex, the central lens to some degree is compressed and hardens, so we call nuclear sclerosis. Chemical changes in proteolytic cleavage of crystallines result in formation of these very large protein aggregates. Uh, we get chemical modification with pigmentation. Uh, we see a decrease in potassium and glutathione, so there's greater oxidative stress risk. Uh, and that will result in opacification. Uh, specifically, nuclear cataracts. Uh, everybody over the age of 50 has some level of sclerosis, although it's usually very mild. Uh, this is, of course, a central opacity of the center portion of the lens, the oldest lens fibers, if you will. Uh, it's easier, easier to visualize. At the slit lamp, though, you can look at it with a well-dilated patient with a red reflex. Typically, it's very slow in terms of its progression usually bilateral, but of course, as we all know, it can be asymmetric. It has a greater impact on distance vision compared to near, so patients typically are gonna have distance vision complaints with a nuclear cataract. Uh, myopic shift is a very classic association with a nuclear cataract as it progresses due to increased index of refraction, as we call second sight, is a historical term for this myopic shift where they start to be able to see up close again without glasses, that's what that means. Uh, let's see. The abrupt change in the index of refraction between the nucleus and cortex will sometimes result in monocular diplopia as well. So those big changes in index of refraction can result in, in sort of ghosting symptoms. Uh, they tend to have a little bit of a reduced color discrimination. You'll often hear patients after cataract surgery describe changes in their color perception, uh, as, particularly at the blue end of the spectrum. Uh, histologically, it's difficult to identify differences compared to a clear lens. So as we talked about, I think you had the question about pathology. Uh, a lot of these things are just really hard to visualize histologically. Uh, on electron microscopy, maybe there's some increased lamellar whorls in some nuclear cataracts, but that's about the extent of the, the change you might see. So cortical cataracts are uh, a local disruption of cell structure of mature lens fibers. Uh, we get uh, integ membrane integrity compromise. Uh, we lose essential metabolites. We get extensive oxidation and precipitation of protein. This is usually bilateral, though it's often asymmetric. The effect on vision is dependent on where it's located, whether it's in the visual axis or not. Uh, classic symptom is glare from focal light sources due to the focal nature of the cortical opacification. Uh, progression is somewhat unpredictable. Sometimes it will be very stable for a long period of time. In other cases, it will progress rapidly. Uh, your first signs, you'll see vacuoles. So when you see vacuoles in the lens, those are in the cortex, if you will, from a anatomic lens standpoint, they're not in the nucleus of the lens. Uh, you sometimes see, of course, water clefts and wedge-shaped opacity spokes, as we're familiar with them from a clinical standpoint. Uh, with complete opacification, capsule to nucleus, uh, cataract is considered mature, so a white cataract. Uh, 
cortex uh, takes up water and can cause swelling. This can result in what we call an intumescent catarrh. It can be under significant pressure, which can create a greater risk for capsule uh, problems as you try to do a capsulotomy, uh, tear outs, uh, Argentinian flag sign, et cetera. So something to be aware of to try and uh, manage that. Uh, when degenerated cortex leaks through the capsule, uh, we call it hypermature. Uh, with further liquefaction of the cortex, you get this uh, freely floating uh, nucleus in the lens. We call it morgagnon. Uh, histologically, you can see swelling and local disruption of the lens fibers uh, if you look at it under the microscope. All right, posterior subcapsular cataracts. Usually, these patients are a little bit younger at onset. Um, They'll often have glare and poor vision with bright lights or bright lit backgrounds. Uh, light will induce pupil constriction, so potentially greater impact uh, if it's centrally located, especially on near vision, uh, of course, with accommodation, your pupil uh, does constrict. Can be age-related, but trauma, steroid use, inflammation, ionizing radiation are associated with PSC formation. The histology, we have post posterior migration of the lens epithelial cells from the lens equator with aberrant enlargement swollen cells called Weddell or bladder cells. Uh, we of course know corticosteroids are strongly associated with PSC formation. Uh, it is related to dose and duration of treatment, so the higher the dose, the greater the duration, the greater the risk. Uh, it's been reported with varied forms of administration, uh, systemic, oral, you know, or IV, but it's also been reported in cases of joint injections, uh, obviously intraocular or topical administration, even uh, with nasal uh, sprays or other things, inhaled forms uh, have been associated with that. In children, uh, you may see some regression if it's an early PSC with cessation of the drug. So sometimes reversal can, can be, a, uh, can be a, uh, induced in a young patient. In older patients, that's not, not likely to occur. Uh, other drugs, let's see, of interest, thiazine is Um, I'm going to worry about those. So I will uh, bring this up. So intralenticular foreign bodies, if it's not cupric or ferric in nature, so not copper or iron based, uh, the capsule compromise is small and self-sealing, sort of fibrosis, it may be okay to leave that foreign body in place. You may get a focal opacity uh, where that foreign body is located, so it depends on where it ends up. Uh, but it's certainly possible that in some cases leaving the foreign body alone until the cataract becomes visually significant is reasonable. Let's see. Ultraviolet radiation, so uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Experimental evidence suggests that uh, cataract risk is at least to some degree related to UV exposure or at least certainly that, or that will increase cataract risk. Um, so we've got epidemiologic evidence that shows there's an increased risk of cortical cataract with increased sun exposure. It accounts for about 10% of total risk in temper temperate climates where you're uh, you know, exposed to greater amounts of uh, UV radiation. Uh, ANSI standards, these are lens standards, uh, will result in about an 80% reduction of UV transmission with prescription lenses or uh, appropriately labeled non-prescription sunglasses. Wearing a hat will reduce UV exposure by about 50%. Uh, so when patients are outdoors, wear a hat, wear sunglasses. And that's one of the reasons why is to prevent uh, increased cataract risk. Oh, let's see, chemical injuries. Uh, so siderosis, bulbi, due to iron deposition and the uh, lens, TM, etc. You'll see a yellowish hue early on, followed by a brown rusty discoloration of the lens if there's an iron-based foreign body that's left in the eye. Um, late manifestations include uh, complete cataract and retinal dysfunction due to damage from the iron body. Uh, Copper-based foreign body, uh, you'll see deposits and decimates membrane, anterior lens capsule, and other intraocular basement membranes in the form of sunflower cataract, so this petal-shaped deposits, uh, yellow or brown pigment, uh, it really is a visual consequence. Um, if a foreign body has a high uh, amount of copper, usually you get a severe inflammatory reaction with necrosis if it's not dealt with. Electrical injury. We talked about uh, metabolic cataracts and diabetes. We talked about that. Galactosemia. Doo -doo -doo. 
So Wilson's disease, of course, the classic Kaiser Fleischer ring, copper deposit in the endosomes membrane. You can see a sunflower cataract with Wilson's disease as well if it becomes more advanced. Myotonic dystrophy uh, can be associated often with a, uh, with a cataract. It's usually a PSC cataract and usually at a younger age. Uh, let's see. So effects in terms of cataract development of nutrition, alcohol, smoking, uh, risks for cataract formation, lower socioeconomic status, lower education level, poor overall nutrition, uh, conflicting results when we look at vitamin supplement studies. AREDS showed no reduction. Um, it did show some moderate protection against development of nuclear opacities. Let's see. Lutein and zeaxanthine, which of course are really important to macular uh, health, uh, of great interest to Dr. Bernstein. Uh, a diet rich in high lutein foods has been shown to uh, reduce the risk of cataract. Let's see. And then smoking and excessive alcohol consumption are associated with increased risk of nuclear opacities, of course, uh, macular degeneration as well. So uh, cataracts associated with uveitis, uh, obviously thought due to the inflammation of, and the subsequent steroid therapy. They're often subcapsular, either PSC and sometimes anterior subcapsular changes. Uh, you can see posterior synechia of the iris to the lens capsule. Uh, oftentimes the anterior capsule can be thickened and even fibrous, the fibrous pupillary membrane on that anterior capsule. Uh, Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis, a specific uveitic syndrome that will present, uh, it's usually unilateral, or present with cortical cataract in many cases. Uh, and 25% of cases will have spontaneous intraoperative anterior chamber hemorrhages. Uh, you get some bleeding uh, during surgery. Typically they have a very good prognosis with surgery. They don't usually have posterior synechia and the inflammation is usually fairly mild. Uh, let's see, cataract associated with ocular treatments we've talked about. Uh, vitrectomy association, and of course, corticosteroid association, hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy. Uh, so somebody who is undergoing hyperbaric uh, treatments will often see a myopic shift, uh, although there's no change detected in the corneal curvature or axial length, so thus it's presumed that it's uh, in the lens in terms of changes in the index of refraction of lens material. In most cases, the shift will resolve once the treatment is completed. Um, patients do have an increased risk of development of nuclear cataracts uh, with significant exposure to hyperbaric oxygen. We talked a little bit about oxygen exposure to the lens with vitrectomy, how that causes that, so a similar mechanism that increased oxidative stress. Pseudoexfoliation, uh, so this is something that can be associated with a number of different ocular problems, including glaucoma, cataract, and uh, zonular issues. Uh, it's a fibrillogranular material that's deposited in the eye and other or organs. Systemically, it's a basement membrane-like material uh, in the eye. It'll be deposited on the lens, the cornea, the TM, iris, ciliary processes, anterior hyaloid face of the zonular fibers. You'll see little deposits on the lens capsule with an intervening clear zone corresponding to iris excursions, pretty classic clinical appearance. Uh, you'll see atrophy of the iris, the pupil margin, uh, pigment deposition on the interior iris as well. Uh, they usually don't dilate well. Uh, you'll see increased pigmentation of the TM on gonioscopy. Uh, our concern surgically when we're doing uh, cataract surgery in these cases is the capsule is a little more fragile. Zonular weakness is a greater potential problem. Um, and then they, of course, at higher risk for open angle glaucoma. It can be a very aggressive form of open angle glaucoma. Uh, it can be unilateral in clinical presentation, but we always assume or presume that it is bilateral even if it's asymmetric clinically on exam. And it tends to be more apparent with increasing age. There's no question there's an age component to it. Uh, is there anything else? Learn about these in glaucoma. I told you there's a lot of slides in this. It's really epidemiology. Oh, that's it. Okay. So I think we've highlighted some, maybe too much of the, the information there, but at any rate, uh, you know, for the residents, uh, just focus on trying to, with BCSE series, ideally trying to get through particularly some of these less interesting components.
trying to get through it, making some notes of things that you think are important, highlighting those and being able to go back and review those notes as opposed to having to go back and reread those areas. And then if the note doesn't make sense, go back and read that just that small section. That's what I would recommend in terms of OCAP preparation. That way, as you continue through your three years, you'll be able to just go back and review your notes for OCAP prep, particularly for this section, which applies to the first 60 or 70 pages of this BCSE series. Does anybody have any questions about any of the material we presented today? Do they have any other questions? A sort of random question. We, um, I've occasionally had consults questions about people who had electrical injuries, um, like electric shock or uh -huh. like lightning injuries. How does the cataract uh, development yes. occur in those cases? I don't know if you. There's a slide on that. Let's go back to that. There it is. There so electric shock it can cause protein coagulation. Obviously, cataract lens made out of protein can cause focal opacification. Cataract, it's more common uh, with transmission of the current involving the head, so the closer to the eye. Typically, uh, you're gonna see subcapsular and cortical changes. Sometimes it can be progressive. Sometimes you'll see some regression or loss of the change, uh, so it'll improve, especially in younger patients. Uh, and in many cases, it remains very stationary. Have you ever seen those? It's, it's People always tell us to come look, and I'm like, it's been a week. I'm sure they don't have a cataract yet, but <laughs> yeah, I, I would tell them in most cases they can be seen as an outpatient once they're discharged. So they set up an appointment. We'll do a dilated exam and look at things, document what's there. But unless they're complaining of significant vision changes, I, you know, I tell them it's not a, not appropriate for you to see them inpatient. It's not necessary. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> they call you to ask for a consult and say, you know what, uh, yeah, that's not going to cause a, an acute problem. Let's schedule an outpatient visit when they get discharged. Focus on taking care of the, the electrical burn injury or other organ dysfunction associated with electrical transmission. Cataract's the least of their concerns. All right. No other questions? We're going to finish a little early, mostly because this is just hard to get through. And it's very dry, and I can see half of you nodding and bobbing your heads, and that's okay because I fully expect that I'd be doing the same thing. All right, thanks for coming. Thank you. You're thanks welcome.